Hello ladies and gentlemen and welcome back to my channel for another Hot Toys Diecast Iron Man 1 6 scale figure unboxing and review. Today we are taking a look at Iron Man Mark 1 from Iron Man 1. Not the first time Hot Toys have made the Mark 1, not the second, it's actually the third time. Is the third time the charm? Well, we will have to wait and see. Now, I got mine from ToysWonderland.com. Link for that is in the description below. They do have installment plans and a reward system. While you're down there, why not hit that subscribe, bell notification icon, and join button so you're notified as soon as a brand new review goes live on the channel. As for the box art, it is very pretty. Front and center, an image of the Mark 1 diecast with flames in the background. I guess it was his turn. Then down below, Iron Man Mark 1 and diecast. Up top, a special edition foil sticker. On the side of the box, the rest of that image on the front spilling over the edge, Iron Man Mark 1. Down below, another shot of the Mark 1 and up top, Tony Stark building the Mark 1 in a cave. I am so sorry, I guess I was channeling my inner Obadiah. But it was bound to happen either in the video or in the comment section, we know it was built in a cave. Up top, another shot of the Mark 1, the Mark 1's helmet, plus all the warnings and legal info. Oh, and I forgot to mention the entire thing is done in a very subtle but noticeable metallic finish. I mean, you can see that it is subtly reflective. Plus, it does have this very interesting texture on the surface. Up top, Marvel Studios' Iron Man, the film that kick-started the MCU, and Iron Man Mark I. Oh, and on the other side, a big hunk of foam. We do have some tech details kind of sculpted into the foam itself. I'm pretty sure they sculpt foam. Then, in the middle, a Stark Industries logo. Normally, right about now, I'd be going for a snap transition, but... There's really no need. Unboxing diecast figures is really easy. You literally slide off that top layer. It's kind of like a foam drawer that slides out. Up top it says Mark 1. You lift the lid. Job done. The Mark 1 has been unboxed. And interestingly enough, he's packaged with his faceplate up. I really wasn't expecting that. First in-hand impressions are, I can definitely feel the weight here. This guy, yeah, he does live up to the diecast name. What we are going to do now, though, is get all of his accessories laid out in the light box and take a closer look at everything he comes with. Starting off with the display base first, or should I say display bases, because technically, I guess, there are two of them. Now, the smaller one is a diorama display base, super lightweight, but the detail is awesome. We've got an ammo box, an ACOG sight, and a Stark Industries missile lodged into the ground. There's some texture, it looks like sand, he's of course in the desert. There are a couple of rocks and some wooden planks as well. Up top, a kind of funky looking crotch grabber. Now if you're thinking, hang on a minute, that display base looks familiar. Well, it should, it's the exact same mold as the base we got with the plastic version of the Mark 1, the 2.0. So the footprint is the same, but the paint is different. To me, the new one does look a little bit better. But there's also this funky thing. Now you do just set this base on top of the extender, I guess, that gives him a little bit of a height boost in the display. Up front it says Iron Man, this is a raised logo, I love the colour. And around the front, Mark 1. But unfortunately, there's no magnets, no clips, this literally just slides around on top of the base. Plus, if you remove this and you want to use this as the base, there's no crotch grabber. So you're pretty much stuck with this combo, and to me, it's a little bit funky. Around the side, you can see these, which should be familiar, because this shape and these brackets, they were also used for the Justice League bases. Don't get me wrong, I dig that base combo, it looks sick, but there is a lot of reuse here. The top piece and also the bottom is kind of just a reskin of those Justice League bases like I just said. Now we do get two flamethrower effect pieces, one for each side. They actually look like living flame moving and flickering towards the bottom, a little bit more dark orange for the top and lighter yellow to translucent for the bottom. Now they do loop over the forearm and the hand sits over the top, don't worry I'll show you how that works later on. With the original plastic version, yes, you got the flames, but number one, they looked uglier, and number two, they were so fragile, they broke constantly. But these are really thick and sturdy, so no worries when it comes to breakage. Sometimes when we get a special edition, it's a no-brainer. Always get the special edition, because those accessories are must-haves. 
But this time, no, it's not the case. I really don't think this is a must-have. Now, in the film, when he's hammering out the Mark I faceplate on the anvil and he pops it in front of Jensen, okay, that could have been cool. Just include the faceplate, but... The whole helmet, it's completely unpainted, there's no detail on the inside except for these pegs that would peg into a Tony Stark sculpt. Yeah, it's not really my thing. I like the brushed finish, but it kind of feels unfinished. On the inside you can see all the molding points, it's literally the helmet, they've taken the Tony Stark head sculpt out, popped this in the box and called it a day. So for me, special edition is not a must. I don't mean to sound like this whiny brat, uh, why don't I get the special edition? No, I'm generally pretty happy with all this stuff, but there are a couple of things that leave me scratching my head. We do get two extra hands, so four in total, two closed fists on the body, and two open palm hands. The gloves look like gloves, there's some wrinkling, some leather grain on the surface, this would be a velcro panel I assume, there's even some stitching down the sides. On one of them, an armor plate with speckling and a bunch of scratches and dings, and on the other, it's just the glove. What we are going to do now, though, is get the die-cast Mark I himself out here. Standing straight up and down in the light box, no crazy poses or accessories or anything like that. Yeah, that's the Mark I through and through. He's big, he's bulky, his proportions, they're all kinds of funky, but... This suit was never meant to be form-fitting, it was never meant to be sleek, it was literally designed for the sole purpose of keeping Tony alive so he can escape the cave and escape his captors. And in 1-6 scale, in die-cast, oh it is so impressive. But unfortunately, even though they have taken a few steps forward in some areas, they have taken a few steps back in others. So long story short, yes, it's good but we still have a few things to discuss. Up close and personal, kicking things off with Iron Man's helmet and Tony Stark's head sculpt. This time, for the first time ever for a die-cast Iron Man figure, this helmet is made of real metal. That's right, it's the real effing deal. It's nice and heavy, but not too heavy. The neck connector is still sturdy enough to hold it in position. It's not super floppy. It's cold to the touch, and the details, they're pretty good. We've got some dings up the top. You can see his eyes poking through, and around the back, more dings, plus some dirt and grime on the surface, and airbrush shading. Now, I would have liked to have seen even more speckling of dirt and grime around the front, but to me, this helmet still looks accurate to the movie. Now, speaking of accurate to the movie, if you flip up the front panel, Tony Stark is inside. Now, this hinge does feel really strong for now. This panel isn't going anywhere, even though it's metal, but over time, it could potentially droop down. Fingers crossed, though, it doesn't. I was also worried that there's no foam padding around the nose area, so when you slide this panel down, you could potentially scratch his nose. So far though, so good. Speaking of so far so good, that Tony Stark head sculpt is awesome. And yes, I'm fully aware that this head sculpt is a reuse from the plastic one, the 2.0. But the likeness is there, the paint applications are even better this time because, you know, modern technology and advancements in terms of complexion and skin tones and skin texture, the sculpt is the same, but the paint applications are way better. The intensity to the expression with the furrowed brow, overall, this head sculpt gets ticks across the board, at least from me. Now, he does have a proper skin tone neck, but there is this Velcro strap, this kind of faux collar. You could potentially remove that strap and collar if you so choose, so you can see a little bit more of his neck, but to me, I prefer him covered up. He's fighting the Ten Rings, and he needs to protect pretty much all of his body. So having that covered up, it's kind of the way to go for me. Some people may actually say that the back of the Mark I is more detailed than the front of him. And to be honest, you're not far off. There is so much going on here, especially with this generator. But before we get to this, we do have to discuss the welding jacket. It won't take long. It is this very soft, supple, almost suede-feeling brown fabric. We do have some dirt and grime on the surface, and the seams are completely soiled. Now, in the film and in 1-6 scale, it serves as the base layer that all the armor sits on top of. So you can see it poking through pretty much everywhere. Around the back, around the front, and on the arms as well. We do have the correct length of sleeves this time. 
Unlike the plastic version, they ended all the way up here and the rest of this was unpainted bare plastic forearm. This time it comes over the gloves so it's a non-issue, this looks so much better. Up top, these armor plates are metal and they look the part, they don't just feel the part. We've got this raw edge, some speckling on the surface and it's a little bit bumpy. It almost feels like undulated hammered metal, first time I've ever said that but that is the best way I can describe what's going on. There's a weld line, more filth in the crevices around the weld, where it's, you know, it's picked up the dirt from being welded, it's not a clean process. We do have stark and some lettering, because prior to being the Mark I, all of these panels were part of various missiles, so that's why the branding is present. I also like that it looks like the paint has been chipped away and exposing the bare metal underneath. Now, for the generator, Oh my word, there is so much detail. We've got these stretchy metal cables, so when you move the limbs around, they stretch accordingly. Don't have to worry about them popping out or potentially tearing. There are some proper plastic wires that are probably just normal wires, and there are multiple pulleys that, in the movie, would power this rotary section. Whereas in 1.6 scale, there's a USB-C port. So when you plug in the USB-C cable struggling on camera, you push the button, this piece actually rotates. We also have the light up arc reactor and a red light on one of his gauntlets. That would be for the flight feature in the film. Obviously in 1.6 scale, the figure doesn't actually fly, you already know that. Now I like the light up, I like the single plug in, but was there any reason for this to be so loud? I mean, you can hear that, right? It's whirring, it's spinning, it looks cool, but imagine, in the display, he's standing there, he's plugged in, you have to worry about finagling this cable, and you have this thing making this awful racket. Not ideal, I would have preferred a secondary option that you could have just had the lights on without this rotor spinning. I still love the gimmick, but I reckon it could have done with a little bit more work. Also, up the top on this canister, it looks like oil spilling over the edge. I hope that I'm not being too harsh, I really don't mean to. I love when Hot Toys experiment with stuff like this, but having that sound just whirring away in the background like a mini electric toothbrush, it's already getting on my nerves. It's going to get very old very quickly. Especially if you have this guy powered on all the time in the collection, it would drive me crazy. Maybe you're more forgiving than I am, but for me, I'm just gonna leave it off in my display. Up top, this chest plate is metal, more weld lines, more uneven surface detail, it feels once again like hammered metal, couple of rivets, and some lettering printed on the surface. Then for the paint applications, absolutely disheveled. There's dirt and grime, multiple layers of airbrush shading, and we even have some washers in the crevices. For the arc reactor, wires down below, wires up above, wires on the... basically wires everywhere. The arc reactor is fully detailed underneath this clear plastic panel. Then on one side, it is different to the other. It's an asymmetrical design. Most of these armor pieces are slightly movable, so Everything can be adjusted when it comes to posing. Down below we have more wires and some straps and buckles. These almost look like terminals for a car battery that's plugged in down the bottom. Maybe they power the jet boosters, who knows. It's not just the chest plate that's asymmetrical, everything is. The thighs are, the shins are, and the arms are. The shoulder pads are made of metal, one side has a weld line and a little dent, whereas the other has just a teeny tiny scratch. The bicep protector does have a swiveling part up and down on the back and it's nice and flat on the front whereas the other is a lot rounder. We also have some cabling both on the outside of the bicep and on the inside tucked up underneath. There are some mini armature pieces and yes, they do flex with the arm when you bend the elbow. We can see that brown jacket poking through exactly as it should. Now on this side, it's a bit of a party piece. Yes, there's a light for that little button he flicks to initiate flight mode, but there's another one. You can open up this panel and there's a missile, plus it's spring-loaded going up and down. I would love if they had an effect piece that could plug on so it looks like the missile had fired, but 
I know, I'm not complaining, this is still really cool. Then the panel itself is beautifully weathered. There's dents, there's scuffing, there's dirt and grime, and once again, I know I've already said it, but it looks like the paint has worn away. On the underside, the flamethrower, with a little hose connecting around the back. Then on this side, the panel does extend down over the hand, versus this one where the panel is attached to the glove itself. We have this propane canister, and on the other side, another flamethrower, because of course he does have flamethrowers on both sides. The flamethrower effect is very simple to install. You literally pop off the hand, slide it over the forearm, pop the hand back on, and it's done. It's locked in position. Whereas with the plastic one, it was very fiddly and it felt super fragile. This is a massive improvement. The flames look very realistic, and they do line up with the nozzle, so it actually looks like the flames are shooting out the flamethrower. Now, the translucent plastic piece does sit a little bit too close to the hand for my liking, but the effect absolutely still works. Coming down to the legs, they are so chonky. This guy is an absolute unit. This cod piece does look like multiple panels, but it's not. It's one panel, and it's plastic, unlike most of the rest of the armor web. That stuff is die-cast metal. Now, in the movie, these teeth actually would be functional when he rotates his waist, but in 1-6 scale, it's just for show. All the rotation comes from up above. His pants are fabric, and they are pinstripe, which is accurate, but they're so clean. Why are they so clean? The welding jacket, the armor, it's all filthy, but his pants, they look practically brand new. At the very least, you only really see them up above and around the back, so it's not a huge deal, at least not for me. He does have this panel that can move around the back, and it actually looks like Tony would have just grabbed a panel, cut it, welded it together, and said, yeah, that'll protect my butt, no problem at all. I love this little panel back here. It's a small detail, but it is detailed and painted on both sides. Then back around the front, it's asymmetrical. We've got a different knee pad that has this moving piece on one side as compared to the other. This looks a little bit heavier and chonkier. This panel can move forward and back, and when you do, you can peep the pants. Also, these tank treads actually rotate. They serve no real purpose other than to look cool, but if you wanted to rotate this rubbery piece, you totally can. There is so much detail here, and the same goes for the other side. Now, when you bend the knee, all of this stuff actually moves and is functional. I wasn't expecting that. I thought this would just be for show, but it isn't. All of this stuff, like I said, actually moves. Then coming down to the feet, asymmetrical. There's scratches and pitting on the surface for the metal. And the shoe pieces, at least the under panel, is metal. Whereas the boot, nicely textured, sculpted and painted, but... Let's be honest, the real start of the show is all the armor, not what's underneath. Speaking of underneath, we do have some sort of detail for the heel and around the front. And I could have sworn that was a magnet, but unfortunately it isn't. I'm pretty sure that's just the screw that holds this metal plate to the boot itself. And that circular panel is just a screw cover. For a quick side-by-side -side comparison, on the left the die-cast Mark I, and on the right the plastic 2.0 Mark 1. And your eyes aren't deceiving you, the new one is only a hair taller. A lot of people are going to be upset by this, but I couldn't care less, and I'm about to tell you why. Now, in the film, people mistakenly remember him as being this huge, towering, imposing monster, but that was by design. They shot him from below. They were very clever to try and make him look as big as possible. But if you think about it, it's literally some armor plating strapped over his welding jacket, his pants, and his work boots. So where would all the height come from? It's literally just armored up Tony. So he's going to be pretty much the same exact height as Tony. For me, the height is a non-issue. He's big, he's bulky, the proportions are better on the new one, but when it comes to the texture and the paint applications, I don't know. That plastic one is kind of calling my name. Just to hammer the height point home, here we have the new and improved Mech Test Tony. And he's a little bit shorter than Mark 1, but technically, I don't think that's accurate. I reckon he should be even taller, because he's got the Mark 2 jet boots on and they're kind of chalkier than the Mark 1 boots were. Nevertheless, as you can see, Mark 1 is still big, he's still tall, he's absolutely going to stand out, but some people 
they still want him to be bigger. And finally, the moment that a lot of people have been waiting for, the Mark 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and 7, all in diecast, all standing together. And this is a sight to behold. It would make any Iron Man fan happy, and for me, it absolutely does. That issue of the Mark 1 potentially not being as big as some people would like, I know I've said it way too many times, it kind of becomes a non-issue. It melts away when you see them all standing together. It truly is special. Now, we will do this shot again when we get the 2.0 Mark 3 and the 2.0 Mark 6, but for now, yeah. Goal accomplished. For a much closer up zoomed in comparison, new one on the left, original on the right. Well, technically the 2.0. But if you didn't believe me when I said it was a reused sculpt, now I'm pretty sure you do. The sculpt is identical. But where they differ, the paint applications. The new one just looks so much more lifelike. The skin texture, the complexion, and the fact that they actually painted the neck this time, whereas on the original, it was unpainted skin tone plastic. Am I going crazy, or does the plastic one actually look better than the freaking diecast? Usually this straight up isn't a question, the diecast is better all the time. But there's just so much more detail here, the paint is just way better. We've got multiple layers, there's more shading, there's more dirt and grime on the surface, and so many more colours. Now the diecast one, yes, is real metal, so it doesn't have to fake it, it feels nice and hefty in hand, but... Comparing the two, the plastic one, if you're not counting the feel in hand, actually comes across a little bit better. And more weathered all the way round. I mean, even this has chipping and shading and dirt and grime where the new one has some shading, but it almost comes across slightly more cartoony. All of the panels still move the same way, and he kind of looks like the exact same thing, so I'm sitting here questioning myself, Justin. Is the diecast really necessary this time? And so far, I know we're still not at the end of the review, but we're pretty close. I'm not so sure. Going over articulation, this is my personal copy, so I'm going to be more careful. And I suggest you do the same. I mean, we've got so many panels here. We've got metal on metal and metal on plastic. And the last thing we want is any damage or paint rub. Starting off with the head sculpt, there's a ball joint at the bottom and another one at the top. Looking forward to there, looking back to there, decent for flight poses, swivel and pivot side to side. The arms will go up to there before stuff starts pulling like these cables and colliding like the shoulder pad. Going forward and back, butterfly joint at the shoulder that hinges up and down. Swivel at the bicep, I'm pretty sure this would be a double bend at the elbow, but... Come on, there's so much stuff here, it's really bulky, so you only really get 45 degrees, maybe a little bit less. Then a hinge and swivel for the wrist peg. The torso moves forward and back way more than I was expecting, swivel and pivot. The legs will go forward to there before this stuff starts colliding. Going out to there, swivel at the upper thigh, ratcheted bend at the knee getting you to 90. Then down here for the ankle, a double ball peg. Good for forward and back swivel and pivot side to side. Moving on to the three cool and three annoying things. The first annoying thing is unfortunately a multi-parter. Hot Toys, they tried their best to deliver something really cool and they were so close to perfection. But they did stumble just a little, at least in my opinion. First off, they don't include the USB-C cable. Not a huge deal, but still not ideal. I checked the box multiple times, it's not there. The second is, you have to have it plugged in all the time. They could have easily gone with a charge-up internal battery, but no, you kind of have to futz around with the cable, try and hide it in the collection. This, having it plug in around the back, super ugly. Then the last point is when you push the button, this servo that moves this little rotating piece is so loud and very annoying. So even if you want this guy lit up all the time, you have to constantly deal with that fan noise. They could have had a secondary option where you push the button again and this stops but the lights stay on, but unfortunately, it's all or nothing. The second annoying thing, and it pains me to say this because I love this diorama display base, but... Even I know deep down, objectively, it's not very good. This top piece is free-floating, it's not fixed in position. Could have put magnets, but they didn't. And it's also super hard to work with. We've got rocks and wood panels and this missile, so trying to find a spot for his feet, not super easy. You may be thinking, oh, just remove it and use this display base. Well, technically you can, but... 
when you do, you now don't have a crotch grabber, and the Mark 1 is kind of top heavy, so I wouldn't run the risk of just having him standing there in the display. He could potentially fall over. The third annoying thing is normally when we go from plastic to die cast, there is a huge upgrade in quality, both in terms of the look and the feel in hand. But this time? I don't know, yes the new one is heavier, yes it feels more premium, and yes it's made of metal, but the detail on the plastic one, it's just way more HD, there's so much more surface detail. There's texture, there's pitting, there's scratching, and those rivets and weld lines, they look way more real. But that's just a byproduct of making it out of metal, when you cast things out of die cast, the details for lack of a better word, they're just softer. The first cool thing, and I know the plastic one had this too, but it's the pop-out missile gimmick. I love little easter eggs like this. When you open the panel, the missile springs up and in position. The second cool thing is the Tony Stark head sculpt. I know, I know, they reuse it from the plastic one, but there's a reason they did, because this sculpt is incredible. The likeness absolutely there, and now that they've used modern paint application techniques, it looks even better. Then, not to mention the fact that this helmet is metal, the first time ever that we've received a proper metal helmet for an Iron Man figure. The third cool thing is there is so much going on here. We've got so many moving parts and panels. Down here, even the flap around the back, on his feet, around the front. Even this tank tread can be moved up and down, which I totally wasn't expecting. Wrapping up on Hot Toys Diecast Mark 1 in 1 6 scale. Going into this, oh man, I was so excited. We've been waiting for Diecast Mark 1 forever. But that doesn't mean he's perfect by default. Now, yes, it was the last figure we needed in Diecast to complete Marks 1 through 7. Not counting the 2.0 Mark 3 and the 2.0 Mark 6 and the inevitable 2.0 Mark 4 and Mark 2, but just for the initial lineup, this was the last one we needed for our Hall of Armor. So, at the end of this, do I think this is the ultimate, the best, the definitive Mark 1 in 1 6 scale? Actually, no, I don't think he is. I actually prefer the plastic one, which is crazy. I have never said that before. Now, I love the USB-C plug-in, although it's not executed to perfection. The single button for the light-up is awesome. The rotating motor, not so much. It's very loud and very annoying. I like the improved body with the sturdier joints. I dig the feel of the die-cast metal and the new flamethrowers. And overall, the fit and finish just feels a lot better. So what's the problem, Justin? Why do you prefer the plastic one? Well, I love the surface detail. There is so much texture. It feels a lot more real and weathered. Whereas this guy comes across a little bit smooth and almost a touch too clean. There is weathering, there is dirt and grime, but that plastic one, it takes all of that detail to the next level. Which is kind of crazy. I never thought I'd be saying that at the end of this video, but if you are in the market for a Mark 1 and you already own the 2.0 plastic one, maybe don't. Maybe just keep the one you have, because like I said, the plastic one is way more detailed. If you're all about the in hand feel and the cold touch of the metal, though, you can't beat the die cast. This is the one for you, not to mention his head sculpt, paint applications. Yeah, they're way better. Now, as I said at the intro, I got mine from ToysWonderland.com. Link for that is in the description below. They do have installment plans and a reward system. While you're down there, why not hit that subscribe, bell notification icon, and join button if you like the sound of seeing your name in the end credits of my reviews. Like, comment, and subscribe. We'll catch you in the next video. <laughs>